Hey guys, it's Adam from Loose Pixel and welcome back. The other day, I was having a really fun conversation with one of my students. Somebody who I would I would label as being overqualified. And what I mean by overqualified is he's incredibly skilled, um, very unique talent, artistically and technically. Um, incredible, incredible. And I'm sure anybody who saw his work would, would say the same thing. Yet, like so many of us, was really struggling to get seen, really struggling to succeed, to get a rhythm, to find clientele, that kind of thing. And um, I could really empathize with that, not only with, from my own experiences growing up, trying to make a living for myself, but I have, you know, an artist daughter who's starting her new career. I speak to hundreds and hundreds of artists who all share that same thought, that same feeling, particularly once you've gotten over that hump of getting comfortable with fundamentals and you start asking yourself if you're ready to start working as a professional if you start if you're ready to start reaching out and getting paid for this talent for this work for this education that you've put hundreds and hundreds of hours and many years of your life working hard to achieve and I've learned a few things. I've made a few discoveries, not only in my life, that made a very big impact on my success artistically, but something that once you see more and more of it publicly, once you start to see how different personalities can play into this and different approaches can play into this, you start to notice certain habits that artists might have or certain habits that artists fail to break, to be more specific, that that getting over that hump and becoming recognized, becoming seen, being reached out to by different clientele, getting your phone calls returned from employers that you reach out to, you start to see that, you start to see that change significantly. And you start to get that response. You start to get that feedback. You start to feel more pursued as a professional artist. And in my opinion, in some capacity, every artist on the planet who wishes to succeed needs to be able to, to accomplish this in some capacity. And a really good example to get, the, to get this conversation started, to get this topic started, I remember going to a Montreal Comic Con, a Montreal Comic Convention, and um, um, it was one of the first I'd been to because I haven't frequented common, comic cons a lot growing up because I was more of an animation artist. So comic book art wasn't so much something I did, but I've been to quite a few. And the one in Montreal is, is, is no small potato. The, it, the lineups can be hours and hours and hours long. It's super packed. There's a lot of big names that come and check out the Montreal comic cons. So it's a really good one. It's definitely one worth visiting if you ever find yourself in the city. And the reason I went... The main reason why I went was because my friend Jimmy, Jimmy Susan, a uh, comic book artist, um, had a, his booth up. He had a table up and he was very approachable. A lot of people were coming and talking to him and being somebody who's my age, we're both the same age. We're both in our late 40s, um, had had the gift of the gab. He knew how to schmooze. He knew how to reach out. Confided he was also somebody who'd worked as a, as a director. He's had a lot of leadership positions. He's, he's taught all that kind of cool stuff. So he had really good social skills. So when he had his eyes up to the crowd and when people came by his table, he was there to greet them and he chatted them up and, and attract a lot of attention. But he wasn't the one killing it that day. He wasn't the one who was getting the most attention that day. The one who was actually getting the most attention was, was the guy sitting at the table right next to him. And I won't name names just for the sake of not embarrassing anybody. I don't want to, I don't want to call out anybody, but he's a very skilled, very professional artist. He's been doing it for a long time. Amazing artistic skill. And I watched because I was sitting with Jimmy. I sat at his booth the whole time. And I watched as this other guy very quickly gained 
crowds of people around his table. There were just at least at any point in time, he had at least six to 10 people around his table, if not more. So that's a big crowd of people to gather around your table alone. Yes, it had a lot to do with his drawing skill. He was arguably amazing as an artist. But there were a lot of amazing artists at that, at that Jimmy included. Jimmy was very, very skilled as well. So talent alone was not the, could not be the sole cause why he was getting so much attention because, I mean, there was a lot to check out. There was a lot of talent to check out. But what he did have, what he did have in droves was a gift of reaching out to people and not letting them go. He was extremely active in letting people know that they, they were seen and making sure that they didn't leave and making them feel welcome and invited and chat them up at the table. So if he was chatting with one person, somebody was talking to him, he was engaged, he was listening to them, he was responding to their thoughts, he was, he was really engaging their questions and offering them really, really good answers. He was very passionate about answering them. And if somebody came up to the table, he wouldn't just keep talking to that first person. He would keep talking to that first person, but he would take a second and go, he'd go, oh, hey, how are you doing? It's good to see you. And he'd go and he'd put his hand on their shoulder, put his hand on their arm and let them know that they've been seen. And he would even continue talking to that first person while making physical contact with the second and just having his hand on their arm. And then if somebody else came to the thing, he would always stop and say hi to them and say, hey, come here, come here. He wanted to make sure people felt like they were welcome to his table. He didn't let them go. He didn't necessarily chat with people for 30 minutes straight because there was a lot of people he wanted to talk to who wanted to talk to him. So he kind of got through the crowd fairly quickly, but he always gave people a good five minutes of his time and really chatted them up and really made them feel, come on, no, I want you to be here. I want to talk to you. He wasn't asking them for anything. He wasn't pushing his sales. His, all of his artwork was sitting on the table. It speaks for itself, but he was really, really working the crowd. And as such, Everybody gathered around him. And as a result of that, just through, you know, the base, the, the, the science of, of sociability, of social skills, and because he was really friendly, and because he was warm, and because he reached out to people, and because he gave of, of himself to his crowd, he killed it. He sold, he, he cleaned his table out. He, he sold everything for obvious reasons. Jimmy did extremely well too. But he, this guy, really, really, like, he, he ran out of stock eventually. He did so extremely well. And to anybody, any, anybody on the outside looking in, it was not a surprise. But I wasn't only sitting at that table and I wasn't only watching them. I also made a point of walking around the rest of the Comic-Con, being an artist, being artistically curious, wanted to go around and see the other artists that were out there. And apart from a few semi-timid few, I would say the majority, at least 85% of the artists sitting there, and there were many artists at this Comic-Con, this whole section for artists and stuff like that, most of them had their nose in their book. Most of them sat there in the corner of their big table with a sketchbook on the table, doing their damnedest to make sure nobody made eye contact with them. Just their nose in their book and just sitting there and sketching. And they had their artwork on the table, but they were just sitting down and drawing. Now, can I understand why? Well, of course I can, because <laughs> we're artists and we're introverts. And that's very common. We're used to being in our own little private bubble. But they weren't in their little private bubble. They were there to reach out and make connections with people. But I guarantee you, none of them did. In fact, some of them were so bad at this that they even made a point of coming across as being a bit rude, maybe intentionally, maybe not, which actually alienated people. So people would come by. I remember a couple of occasions I'd, I'd come up to a table and go, wow, I would reach out to them being the spectator and I'd go, wow, your artwork's really good. I really like what you're doing there. And I went out of my way to stop and tell them that because I really liked what I was looking at. And he or she would, wouldn't look up and say hi. Most of the time, they just go, thanks. And they just keep drawing with their face two inches away from their book. And I well, had a little awkward glance at some of the artwork on their table. And then I kept walking and I did this over and over again. And I really honestly felt like I was walking through this corridor of antisocial people. And you might think that I'm 
passing judgment on them. You know, like, my God, what's wrong with these people? But being an artist, I mean, none of it came as a surprise to me. It didn't come as a surprise why they were shy, because we sit in our little bubbles, in our little office, in our studio with our heads set on and our drawing stylus, probably something you're doing right now as we speak, if you're not sleeping or making lunch. Um, thank you for joining me either way. And... Um, it's no surprise, but it's also no surprise why their tables were still stacked full at the end of the day. Here's my cat coming to join me. Hi, Gimli. Can I jump on the table? There you go. So, I look at that. I look at that, that, that mentality. I look at that here. My cat's going to bump the microphone, so let me move it out of the way. I've got a cat tail in my face right now. This is making it... I'm, yes, I'm distracted. I apologize. Gimli, stop it. I'm trying to record something. And um, I take that and I reflect that in an artistic career. And I think about the career I've had. And I think about artists that we know online. Mark Brunet and Bobby Chu and Tyler Adlin and Chris Oatley and Cynics and uh, Kelsey Rodriguez and, you know, you name it. I could go through the whole list. I name drop a lot, right? I could go through the whole list of these artists. And a lot of these artists, all of these artists that I've mentioned, have made names for themselves, are recognized. They get work. They have found success in their life. They've, they've done well financially. All of the things that come with a successful career, right? And if you sit back and ask yourself for a second, how did they get to where they are? How did... How did Clint Kearley and Diana Kearley, how did they become known artists? Is it just because they're really good at art? No. I mean, they are amazing at art. I mean, for God's sakes. <laughs> if, if you want a mentorship to join, join theirs, for goodness sakes. I mean, they're, they're the top of the top out there as far as that goes. But that's not the reason why they're doing it. That's not the only reason why they're doing extremely well. That one of the reasons why Clint and Diane do so well as professionals. The reason why Antonio Stapertz does so well as an artist, all of these artists, is because they were the ones to reach out first. They understood that most people, artists especially, but people in general, I, you know, I can, I can apply this to anybody. I've spoken to people from every different walk of the planet, engineers, uh, computer scientists, biophysicists, neurosurgeons, you name it. We're shy. Making connections with other people is challenging. It's hard. It's, it's, it requires, it's a muscle that needs to be trained. It's a part of your brain that needs to be developed. And when you're sitting in your quiet space all day, every day, it's the equivalent of not working out at the gym. Eventually those muscles start to get out of shape. So when you do find yourself in a social environment, when you do find yourself in public, when it is time to reach out and make connections, that muscle is so underdeveloped that you find yourself unable to lift that weight, or at least you feel like you're unable to make, lift the weight. You feel weak socially. And it was very interesting for me, there was a period of time in my life between teaching and before when I start before I started my mentorship and between that and working professionally where I was kind of a homebody for a little while because I was I was at home I had a young kid I had a lot of private time with just me and and Lucas my son when he was just a little baby and stuff like that and I was building my mentorship and I was doing all those different types of things but there was a long stretch of time where I was where I didn't get to socialize a lot apart from just with my immediate family I didn't get out of the house a lot and I remember clearly that feeling of when a friend would call and invite me over to their house or if somebody was just calling to have a conversation or if I'd have a little chat with somebody sitting at the bus stop or anything any little social interaction or if I was talking to a waiter at the cafe or something like that I was awkward as shit it was like I was out of shape I was out of shape socially and it was awkward and it was weird and it was, and I walked away going, man, what's wrong with me? <laughs> I'm so used to being sociable that it really felt weird. It felt out of place for me. 
But it made me realize, hey, shit, if I'm not the type, if I didn't have that lifestyle, if I wasn't a teacher normally by profession, if I hadn't worked as a director, if I wasn't a YouTuber, if I wasn't the type of person who did have opportunities to speak out every day, I could imagine it being even worse. It would be like I've never been to the gym and all of a sudden I'm walking in for the first time and there's all of these steroid, steroid jockey people out there walking down all buff and I'm some skinny little, skinny little prick, right? It would feel that way. It would feel incredibly awkward to do that. And that is a big deal. It's a big deal. That weakness, if you want to put a mus muscle analogy to it, that if I'm using, if I'm using muscles as a reference point, being that out of shape is bad for your health. It's bad for your personal health, but it's also very it's also very hard on your professional life, particularly today as a an artist who is more aware of how many artists are out there with sites like ArtStation and DeviantArt and Google and Pinterest and all these different websites all these different social gatherings. And then you see more and more art YouTubers out there and art Instagram influencers and Twitch streamers and all that kind of stuff and TikTokers. You become very, very aware of the competition out there. And that can be daunting. That can fill you with self-doubt and even further reinforce your shyness and your, your fear of reaching out and making connections with other people. And... That needs to be overcome. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. If you think about it, if you're that if you're that artist at the Comic Con with your nose in a book, it doesn't matter how good your art is. It doesn't matter if you're the best of the best. If you're at, unless you're like already an established like celebrity artist and you just you're just too cool to give a shit type of thing. There's that too. But if somebody comes up to your table and you're a big hot shot and you're antisocial and you don't reach out to people and you just kind of give somebody a flippant, you know, thanks or whatever. And you keep drawing and you don't bother making eye contact with them. How many of those people are going to come back to your table the second time? How many of those people are going to speak fondly of you? How many people like that aren't going to, aren't going to pass the message? Yeah, I, I met Joe Schmo at the, at the Comic-Con. Yeah, he's a great artist, but man, he was a bit of a dick. I don't know. He, just, he was really cold. He didn't even bother to say hi to me. He was like, mm, whatever. I, you know, whatever. That the, the Word gets around. It's a small community. Word gets around and people get to know which artists are sociable and friendly and warm and welcoming and which ones are, aren't. But more importantly, you want to remember these artists. The reason why, if I say the name Kelsey Rodriguez, if I say the name Istabrak, if I say the name Bobby Chu, if I say the, if I say the name Borodante, you immediately know who I'm talking about, don't you? You know those artists. Do you know them because they're great artists? Well, there's definitely that. They are definitely professionals. They have definitely proven their worth professionally. They've put in the work. So that that prerequisite is out of the way. But the reason you know who they are and the reason why they might get opportunities you do not is because they made themselves known. They knew that nobody was going to come and show up at their doorstep and say, Hey, are you an artist? Can I see your stuff? No, they knew they had to reach out first. They had to reach out and grab your forearm and welcome you to the table and make eye contact with you and talk to you and let you know that they exist like I'm doing right now. I'm reaching out to you and sharing my thoughts and my feelings with you. This is me reaching out my hand and grabbing your arm. Okay? And I want you to think of it that way. Without the the main difference, the main most important difference between me having a YouTube channel and me sharing my thoughts and feelings with you every day and me and you knowing who I am is because around 10 something years ago, 10, 12 years ago, I picked up a headset, a shitty little Diablo 3 headset that sounded like absolute garbage and had the build quality of 
rice paper and a crappy little rubber, gray rubber Logitech 720p little ball webcam. And I recorded a stupid video and shared my feelings. That was me telling you, I don't know jack shit about video and audio production, but I'm saying hi to you. Here's me reaching out my hand and offering you my hand. I'm making that first contact. I am not assuming that you're going to go out of your way to discover me. I have to make myself discoverable. And I kept doing it. And I kept doing it. And I kept doing it. And I kept doing it for years and years and years. And as those years accumulated, I reached out to more and more of you and more of you reached out to me. And because I made that contact, because obviously I wasn't a dick about it, I wasn't, I wasn't rude or mean or, or an elitist about it, I didn't make people feel uncomfortable with my message, I was being nice about it, that people said, hey, Adam's a nice guy. He's worth knowing. Maybe I can talk about him. And that, that spread the message around. Some from word of mouth, some from discovery. But all I had to do was reach out and reach out consistently. Does it matter that I'm tell- that, that every message I share with you is the smartest, coolest thing you've ever heard? No. Probably not most of the time. Who gives a shit? (laughs) Does it really matter if I'm blowing your mind every single time I open my mouth? No, I'm not trying to blow blow your mind every time I open my mouth. I'm just trying to make a connection. I'm just trying to share something that I'm feeling and I'm feeling with you. I'm trying to bring you value from something I've experienced in my life, like I'm doing right now. Is it mind-blowing? Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. I'll let you decide. It's not up to me to decide that. All I have to do is reach out my hand and grab your wrist. All I have to do is make eye contact with you and let you know that you've been seen. That's what I'm doing. Now, I take this thought and I, I, I think about other artists that do this, what I'm doing right now, but have done it far more successfully, far more effectively. They're much better at it than me. And the first name that always comes to mind is Bobby Chu. Bobby Chu isn't only somebody who's good at networking, but he's somebody who's incredibly good at not only connecting himself to his peers, but connecting everybody to everybody else. He's this magnet for co- connectivity. It's absolutely crazy. I don't. You might not know this if you're newer to the artistic industry or if you've only discovered Bobby Chu recently, or, or maybe I'm helping you discover him right now because I'm helping him network right now just by mentioning his name. That's why I mention artist names all the time because it goes, oh, who's Borodante? Let's go and check it out. Um, so I'm helping other people network as well. But um, I remember back in the early, early days after he had taught at Sheridan College, a very celebrated teacher at Sheridan College, big, big college here in Montreal, in Canada, in, in uh, Oakville, Ontario. And um, he started, he started of his own volition Subway sketching, which was him reaching out online socially and being the person who put together groups. He made this community where people could join up this subway sketching thing and they would meet up at a predetermined place and time every so, so at, a, at a regular time. And he would get together, he would gather the group together and they'd all grab their sketchbooks and they'd go and jump on the subway and sketch people on the subway, hence the name subway sketching. And he did it regularly. He didn't just do it once. He did it regularly until people started to realize, hey, you know that this guy, Bobby Chu, he starts this whole subway sketching thing in Toronto. You should come and check it out. And he started to build this community, all of his own. And all he had to do was reach out and make that first step. And it built until it started to become, it still started to become, it started to develop a real name for itself. People started to recognize it and seek it out which is pretty cool, right? And then at a certain point, once he started to gain a little bit more momentum and people started to know him a little bit better, he knew he started to have the ability to be able to reach out and grow. He always, always grasped at any opportunity he had for growth. He always had hands out, ready to grab wrists, always. And this is the thing that I've always paid attention to him. He's This is what he's gifted at. I've seen him do it time and time again. I've watched the very quick evolution of his career. 
he joined this thing called Sketchaholic online. It was this website where he was a part of that. And then there was Imaginism Studios that he started. And from Imaginism Studios, once he started to really develop a name for himself, he also had his YouTube channel, his Bobby Chu YouTube channel that he'd, that he'd also had going at the same time. He started it before I did, I believe. Yeah, he definitely started before me. And um, so he's been doing this. He's one of the old veteran YouTubers as well. He knew that that was a platform he needed to actively be a part of. And then through enough notoriety, through enough being known, he got recognized by different bigger productions combined with his talent, of course, because he's not, he's not a guy who didn't bother learning to draw. You know, he's an amazing artist and teacher. And Tim Burton caught his eye. And he reached out and he got the opportunity to, to, to work on Tim Burton films. And that was, he didn't need, that was, he didn't need to oversell that idea. He just knew that this is an opportunity, a, a big, big hand that reached out through the crowd that he grabbed. And then he rode with it. And he didn't just say, wow, look at that. I got a good job and I got paid well. Okay, well, where's the next job? No, he realized that he can use this as a very powerful networking tool to attract attention from other people, from other professionals who've also worked on big projects and for big names. And he started to, do, he, he, he founded and built Schoolism, which is still going strong to this day. It's 10 times the size it was when he first started, because as it got bigger and bigger, it started to attract more and more hands and he grabbed them out. He'd grab all these different hands, these different professionals, all these different people from different walks of life who had different particular skills in storyboarding and, 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 you know, and lighting and color and, and the science of light and composition and oil painting and and environmental illustrations and character design and you name it. So you're welcome for the plug, Bobby. <laughs> Pro bono, what can I say? But he, he earned it because I'm sitting there watching him being incredibly clever with every little, every single time you throw him a crumb, he didn't go, thanks, eat it and walk away. No, he took that crumb and sculpted it into a masterpiece. And you've got to respect somebody for doing something like that. And the whole time, he wasn't shrewd and rude and disrespectful and entitled. He was generous and appreciative and kind and warm to everybody he met. And I can say that for a fact because I, when I, the first time I met him in person was at a schoolism workshop in Montreal because they were hosting it at the, teacher, at the school that I taught at, at the Cedar of Old Montreal. And I reached out to him and I said hi to him for the first time and I gave him a big compliment for being a big inspiration to me. And he was the kindest freaking person I've ever met in my life. Everybody I met at schoolism workshops. I met Carla Ortiz and I met, I met uh, um, uh, uh, Sam Nielsen and I met Nathan Fawkes and I met you know, the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle. Everybody there was amazing. But Bobby had this real warmth and I could see this is the reason why people want to work for you because you make people feel good. He has that teacher's quality of making people feel valued and smart and talented. He's very genuine. He's not full of shit. He's, he's a down-to-earth guy. I wouldn't be saying any of these wonderful things. He wouldn't be getting free promo from me today had he not started his subway sketching. Had he not gathered the momentum of subway sketching to get into Sketchaholic and Imaginism Studios and Schoolism and then doing workshops in every freaking corner of the planet since then. He reached out first. Is Bobby Chu Mr. Bang Bang Social Guy? No. He's shy. He's introverted. He's soft-spoken. He's quiet. He's thoughtful. He, he, he... He reminds me a lot of watching chess players. <laughs> they're very introverted people who, you know, they have their little quick handshake and then they get to the game. But they're, but he, he, despite all that, he didn't try to be something he wasn't. He didn't need to be Mr. Flashy guy like the guy who was at the Comic-Con who was reaching out and giving everybody big, big teethy smiles. No, he was a little bit more discreet about it, but he did it anyways. And look what, look what he's accomplished as a result of that. And that brings me back to this student that, that I saw, that I spoke to the other day. And we're having this conversation about how to get out there, how to make a name for himself. And he's describing different things he's done. And he had this gallery exhibit and this and that and everything like that. And I could see that the missing ingredient was 
You have all the talent. Not only does he have the talent, he has the talent plus around 400%. I mean, if you saw this guy's work, your jaw would hit the ground. I mean, this guy just like, oh, amazing. He had the talent. He had the, he had the, the professional portfolio put together. He had consistency. He had a very unique and very identifi identifiable style. You can pick him out in a lineup of a thousand artists easily. He has a charming personality, friendly, very, a nice looking guy, very, very, you know, you know, he takes care of himself. Everything about him was just winner, was just wonderful. But nobody knows he exists. Except for maybe the people who visited his gallery. And I said, that's what you got to take care of. You don't need to get better at art. You draw just fine. You draw just fine. Your personality, everything about you is just fine. And when I'm saying just fine, I want to, I want to emphasize something here. By just fine, I don't just mean you're attractive and well presented and you've got a nice looking studio and you've got a great sounding speaking voice and you've got a talent that's unparalleled. No, that's not what I mean by just fine. Although he is all of the above. If he was, if he was, if he had dirty fingernails, if he had messy hair, if he had five o'clock shadow, if he dressed in his pajamas like, like the big Lebowski all the time, which a character I absolutely love, <laughs> but he was kind and caring and inviting and polite and respectable, despite being somebody who had, you know, who wasn't, who wasn't the the business class example of of groomed and and you know marketable like a salesperson we're artists here fine means you're relatable you're authentic and you're kind that's what that means so how you look where you're from how many tattoos you've got what clothes you wear that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about somebody who, when somebody walks up to you to say hi, they, they are grateful they did. And if somebody comes into your presence and they're an artist and you're an artist and you have something to share and you have something valuable to share between the two of each other, that, that you're the type of person who needs to know that nobody else is going to reach out first. That's always, always going to be your responsibility. I know this as a teacher. I have a chance to, to make connections with thousands and thousands of artists. Every single, every single time I have a class, a session, a private session with one of my students, every single time I speak to a fellow artist or I do a podcast with a fellow artist online, I am very aware of and very sensitive to kindness. I'm very much aware of the fact that when somebody goes out of their way to make me feel appreciated, to make me feel a sense of belonging, to make me feel comfortable, to, to, to be welcoming and forgiving to my awkwardness, I love them for that. I really appreciate them for that. And I always try to be the one to do that too. I always want, I want the person I'm talking to to know that I genuinely care. I'm not just, I'm not, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not full of shit. That if I look at you in the eyes and I tell you that, that you matter, it's because you do. I'm not making shit up. And it makes me think of, you know, an artist that I, that I, I can never get enough of. And somebody who's a very big influence to me and somebody who I've had the chance to collaborate on a couple of things together and am floored by her kindness is Ista Brack. I remember when we did that whole AI podcast thing and I was a little awkward and I hadn't slept the night before and I'm, I'm at the table with some seriously smart people like Kelsey and, and Antonio and, and Steve Zapata. Like I'm sitting at, I'm sitting at a round table with a freaking geniuses and I'm feeling dumb as nails that day. I was just, I was about as sharp as a rubber hammer and, and everybody was very cool about it. But Istabrek always made me feel okay for being a little stupid, <laughs> for not having the smartest answer at the table. She made me feel 
welcomed. And it was my podcast. I was hosting it for God's sakes. And I had to reach out to her after that and say, my God, you're, you're such a kind person. You're so, you're just such a kind person. I could see she cared about my comfort. You don't think I'm not going to pay that forward to her? Oh my God, yes. People like that are precious. And if you do that to other people, it matters. If you reach out and make a connection with other people, if you grab them by the arm and look up in the look at me in the eyes and say, "Yeah, yeah, I'll be right there. Just thank you for coming." And you let them know that they matter, and you don't just stick your nose in a book or you just don't sit there at home and make cold calls to companies or send your portfolio to different studios and hope somebody's going to call you back, and you do this hundreds and hundreds of times until you start to get very disillusioned about it, and you're not actually making a presence of yourself online my opinion is you are hamstringing yourself you're diminishing your potential by around 75 percent because 25 percent is talent 25 percent of a success is talent the other 75 percent is letting people know you exist in my opinion in 2024 and moving forward just being an artist and just reaching out to people is not enough. In fact, I would argue it's never been enough. It's never been enough to just exist and to just have talent. People need to know who you are. You need to find some, some medium, some means, in this particular case, online, but it can also be in person, if you're the person who likes to do gallery exhibits and stuff like that, and you prefer the more one-on-one -on -one connection with people, or if you're somebody who prefers to go to Comic-Cons and make yourself known at Comic-Cons or different conventions, different exhibits, these are all opportunities for you to make connections with people. And if you are, you have to commit yourself to making those connections. And you have to commit yourself to making those connections regularly. People need to know who you are. And that way, People can put a face and a voice and a name to this beautiful art that you create. People put a face and a name to it. If I think of the name, if I look at a painting by Ahmed al Duri, if I look at his artwork, I know the guy who called me when he was with Steve in New York City just to tell him, I love you, you know? I just wanted, we just wanted to let you know that you loved and we were thinking about you. And they were in fucking New York. They weren't even in Montreal, for God's sakes, right? They were, they were in, they were in the States and I'm in Canada. And I never forgot that. Or Anthony Jones reaching out. He sends me a quick phone call and he said, I just wanted to get in touch with, with you just to let the people in my life that I appreciate, let them know that I appreciate them. I just got a random call from him out of nowhere. I'll never forget that. And, and, I sit there and I, every day when I'm sitting here, as I'm painting this painting you're watching right now, I'm listening and watching Anthony Jones videos. That I have it on my second screen. You just can't see it. Why? Because I'm not just watching an artist who inspires me. I'm listening to a friend. I'm listening to somebody who I care about. And when you guys reach out and you have kind words to say to me, when you say nice things to me, that really matters to me. You're, you're showing me exactly what I'm talking about. You're, you're, you are living proof of the power of kindness because it always matters. It always matters to me. And I'm sure it matters to you too when I, when I return that in kind. Okay. With that said, I love you all with all my heart and happy painting. Take care.